Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to ACE Machine Learning in Biology. I'm a Bill Chen stream owner, and I currently work as a machine learning engineer at the San Francisco Bay Area. ACE is a community of machine learning practitioners and researchers who have gathered around topics in machine learning and AI research, engineer and pro products. We host free live sessions like this three to five times a week and produce premium content in various of, uh, of in variety of subject areas. To see more, visit AI.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Machine Learning Explainable, and to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. We currently have more than 30 different streams and are focused on various uh, machine learning topic. And this session is in machine learning in biology stream. Hope you enjoy it and come back. Today, our invited presenter is Dr. Zhou, and his topic is computer vision to deep phenotype human disease across uh, physiology, tissue, and the molecular scale. Dr. Zhou is, a, uh, is an assistant professor of biomedical data science, computer science, and the uh, WE at uh, Stanford University. He is also a Chang Zuckerberg investigator and the, the faculty director of Stanford AI for Health. Dr. Zhou develops novel machine learning algorithms that have strong statistical guarantees and that are motivated by human health challenges. Several of his methods are well used by the tech, biotech, and the pharma companies. He also works on questions important for the broader impact of AI, fairness, accountability, interpretation, and uh, robustness. He has received several best paper awards at the top computer science venue. The 2019 RECOMB Best Paper Award and the NSF Career Award, a Google Faculty Award, and a Tencent AI Award. Without further ado, let's start our today's talk on computer vision on deep uh, on computer vision on deep phenotype human disease across physiology. Physi sorry physiological tissue and the molecular scale. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thanks, Bill, for organizing this and for the introduction. And it's very nice to meet all of you. So um, as Bill mentioned, so I'm James. I am a professor at Stanford. I'm very excited to tell you today about some of the recent technology developments that we've been developing in machine learning, especially in computer vision. And I also tell you about how can we use these computer vision algorithms to study human disease from these different perspectives. So to set the stage for the rest of the talk, I want all of us here to do a little thought experiment. And so for this thought experiment, I've written on the screen here, right, several standard descriptions of a particular individual. And I would like you to visualize in your head what you think the face of this person actually looked like. Right, so take a couple seconds to do that. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the actual face, right? And so here's the actual face, right? And you can try to compare that with what you had visualized based on these, these text descriptions before. Um, and you can see how close can you get to it. This is actually quite a challenging experiment. So right? why I did it myself or my students did it, right? So it's actually very hard based on what's written down in the text descriptions to get a face that looks as vivid or as interesting as the face that's actually captured here. And I think this photo here of this particular individual is quite interesting for a couple of different reasons. Right, so first, this is a photo that's actually taken from a New England Journal of Medicine st study from a couple of years ago. And you can notice that this person's face is actually asymmetric. It actually means that this half of the face is actually looks much older and sagging and more wrinkled compared to the other half. And the reason why this is is because this person is actually a truck driver. As you can imagine, as, this, as he drives the truck for many hours a day, right? So one half of the face, this half is actually exposed to the sun, exposed to the environment, and the other half is facing inside. So this actually, sh you know, is a very vivid way to illustrate how the environment, the exposure to the environment, combines with the underlying biology and genetics of this individual to inform his health status. 
So that's quite interesting. The other reason why it's quite interesting is that this person, um, I think this picture sort of very vividly illustrates that there's a lot more information that we can capture by looking at an object than with standard kinds of descriptions. Right? The kind of descriptions here could have contains maybe bytes or kilobytes of information. And these are the kinds of information that you normally find in, let's say, in medical records. But the image itself could have megabytes and oftentimes gigabytes of information, right? So there's a lot of more information here that we can capture with our, by looking at it with our human vision. Right. So this illustrates the fact that I think a lot of information is quite visual, right? Um, especially when it comes to looking at the health and the biology or disease of individuals, right? So, and I'm showing here sort of examples, right, from looking at cardiac ultrasound, looking at biopsies of cancer patients, or looking at even individual cells, right? So oftentimes in healthcare and in medicine, we're trying to reduce this information, right, into sort of standard features. And that actually loses a lot of content, right? So the goal of this presentation is to tell you how can we use recent advances in computer vision to essentially learn a new language to describe the morphology and the dynamics of these very complicated and rich objects in order to study human di disease. And a lot of the advances in the, the technology that we use to do this actually, actually comes from computer vision, right? So that's actually one big area where my group has been doing a lot of work. Right. And many of you are familiar with different applications of computer vision, ranging from self-driving cars to different, you know, to facial recognitions, right? And my group has also been doing developing approaches, right, that makes these computer vision algorithms easier to work with, easier to interpret, and more reliable, more robust. So what I want to do in this presentation is to give you a couple of medical examples of how we can apply these computer vision algorithms to study human disease. And then I'll come back and tell you about some of the machine learning tools that we've developed that makes these computer vision algorithms very easy to interpret and easy to work with. So I'm happy to take questions throughout the presentation. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Okay. So the first example I want to give and talk about is how do we use computer vision to study something that's very fundamental, right? Which is to study the human heart. This is based on a paper that we published in Nature a few months ago earlier this year. And the work is really led by two terrific people in my group, David, he's a cardiology fellow on the MD, and then Brian, who is a terrific computer science PhD student in my group. Okay, so heart disease, right? Uh, so why do we want to study this problem, right? So heart disease is the leading cause of death in the US and in most of the countries, right? So in the US, it's actually responsible for one in four deaths in this country every year. Um, and typically, right, so these kinds of ultrasound taken off the heart, it's called echocardiogram, is one of the common ways that people, that clinicians use to study how well the heart is functioning, right? So these are routinely collected. There are over 10 million of these cardiac ultrasound done every year in the US. And they're actually quite expensive, right? So each one will cost over $1,000, sometimes as much as $10,000 to, to collect and to analyze one of these ultrasound videos. So here I'm showing you sort of four example ultrasounds, right, taken actually from four different patients at Stanford. Right? So one of the reasons why these ultrasounds are quite expensive right, to analyze is that because it's really currently very much relies on human expert vision, uh, human vision to manually look at these ultrasound videos. So I'll just give you a very quick primer of what the cardiologist is looking at here. Right, so you can think of the human heart as basically this power pump, right? So, and if you want to assess how much power the pump is generating, one way you can do this is to, you look at this video, right? You look at this particular chamber here, which corresponds to the pump. You find the frame in this chamber, right? In front of the frame in the video where the chamber is the largest, right? So the cardiologist will actually find that frame then they will trace out and compute the area of the, the volume of the pump. And then they also manually find the frame where the heart is the smallest, when it's the most contracted. And then they will also trace it out and then identify the volumes. So by looking at the volume when it's the largest versus when it's the smallest, that's how the cardiologist sonographers get a sense and can compute things like how well the heart is functioning and how much power it's generating. This process, as you can imagine, is hugely expensive because it's very manual, right? They have to find these frames and do all the tracings and all the computations by hand, which makes it quite expensive. That also makes it quite unreliable because you have two different individuals looking at the same videos, 
oftentimes they can reach different conclusions. So this is where we say, okay, so can we actually develop a computer vision algorithm to replace the human expert visions and to assess how well the heart is functioning, to assess the cardiac ultrasound videos. And this is what we did in this Nature paper, right? So we developed an algorithm, which I'll describe in the next slide, right? So the algorithm will take as the input, this ultrasound video of the heart, right? And then it actually uh, you know, identifies this chamber of the heart and then segments and tracks it over time. And in real time, in every beat of the heart, it actually produces the assessment of how much power or how much ejection fraction, right, that beat of the heart is generating. Right, so this actually sort of fully automates this process and makes it much easier for clinicians to assess how well the heart is working. So the algorithm itself, which is what we call the Econet dynamic, right, so it's a particular kind of deep neural network, right, so it takes its input, these ultrasound videos, and there are basically two main components, right, the top arm and the bottom arm of the network. So the top arm of the network, which I'll just briefly describe, is a particular kind of spatial temporal convolution. So it's just looking at convolutions both across space and also across time because we have a video here. The bottom arm of the network is actually doing something that's quite interesting, right? It's actually tracing out a specific chamber of the heart that corresponds to this relevant pump, right? And it tracks that chamber over time. And both these two arms actually come together here to come together to, right, to make a, a assessment of how much power the heart is generating for every beat. Uh, and based on the assessment, it can predict things like heart failure. It can also predict whether there's other outcomes related to kidney functions, liver functions. So there's a variety of things that we can predict based on this. So the key machine learning technical idea here that is that by having these two arms, right, two branches of the algorithm, we actually can use this temporal segmentation right, to, as a way to focus the attention of the model. Right, so that you can think of that as sort of giving the model a little bit prior, so it so knows then to look at the right, the the chain, the correct area in this in the videos and look at the relevant beats. Okay, so the algorithm actually works quite well uh, in practice, right? So the one thing you want to be very careful of is that when you're evaluating AI algorithms for especially for human disease and medical applications, you want to make sure that you're evaluating them on patients that are very different from the patients that you train the algorithm. Um, right, so we train the data, the trained algorithm actually on patients and data from Stanford, where it performs really well, right, at AUC of 0.97. And then what we did is that we actually froze the algorithm, right, fixed the hyperparameters, no fine tuning, right, and then just shipped it and tested it on data from a different hospital, which is Cedar Sinai, which is actually a hospital near, in Los Angeles. So without any modifications out of the box, we're very happy to see that the algorithm works just as well on patients in Cedar Sinai, right? It was AUC about 0.96, as it does come in the Stanford patients where we trained the model. Right, so that just gives quite a bit of confidence that this you know, computer vision-based AI system could actually work reliably well across different hospitals, across different settings. So the other thing we really want to be careful of is, is the algorithm really reliable, even when the data is noisy? Right, so we tested this, right, to give a very st a stressful test. So we actually look at how well would the algorithm work when the data becomes extremely noisy, right? So the x-axis on this plot corresponds to increasingly noisy data, right? So on the extreme here, right, so that corresponds to when up to 50% of the pixels in the videos are actually corrupted with noise, right? So that's actually a very strong kind of corruption because half of the information, half of the pixels are corrupted. And the y-axis corresponds to basically the accuracy of the model. Okay? And we're also very happy to see that even when 50%, when half the video is corrupted, right, the model actually still has very high performance. You know, it drops off a little bit, but still you know, certainly above the acceptable bar. Right? So this gives us a lot of confidence in the model is doing something sensible and it's actually making reliable predictions. OK. So if you're interested to learn more about these kinds of models and data, we have actually released all of our data and all of the code to train and to test these models, to train and test the Econet dynamic. I just want to mention about the data itself, right? So it turns out that for people who want to study video data, it's actually very little medical video data sets that are publicly available. So that makes it very difficult for the machine learning, for the AI community to make developments. Right? So to address that problem, we have actually released uh, all of our data, which is currently the largest 
were one of the largest publicly available data sets of medical videos, right? It has over 10,000 of these patient videos of cardiac ultrasound together with annotations, patient information outcomes, right? So the, all of the data is publicly available and you're all welcome to play around with it and to, to use it to further improve these models. Uh, hopefully this will become a valuable resource for the broader AI community of people who want to develop methods, especially for these medical videos. I think there's a lot of really important work to be done in that area. Okay, so hopefully that gives you one example of how we can use computer vision to study this human disease by looking at the ultrasound. So I want to tell you a second example briefly, which is how we can use similar computer vision algorithms to study cancer. All right, so here's basically a biopsy of a breast cancer patient, right? And typically what people do is that, you know, if you take this biopsy, right, you actually give it to a pathologist or go to a pathology lab, and the clinician would actually look at this biopsy, right, maybe under a microscope, and then just based on how the image looks, right, they would actually identify which part of this image corresponds to tumor regions, which part corresponds to healthy or normal regions. Right, so that's actually a very common way people use to assess cancer, cancer, cancer biopsies. In parallel, many of you might have heard about these more recent developments using genomics technologies. Right? In particular, people are developing lots of tools where you can use single cell methods to analyze individual cells from these biopsy samples. Now, these histology imaging ones and single cell analysis approaches are, you know, they have complementary pros and cons. Right? So the advantage of the histology is that you have the image itself. So there's a lot of spatial information right, about how cells are connected, how they're interacting with each other. Um, and the downside of this is that the information you can gl glean from this is actually quite low in terms of information content. Maybe you get some, you know, a few bits of, of, of information of whether it's a tumor or normal, but you don't really get any information about different types of cells or different types of genes, different mutations. The genomic information from the single cell analysis has the opposite problem, right? So it's very rich, it's very, very cell, you get a lot of information. But typically, you lose the spatial location of where the cells come from, right? You don't have this image anymore, so you don't know which cells are interacting, so that's, you lose a lot of other information. So what we want to do in our work is to see, can we actually use computer vision right, to get the best of both worlds? So we have both the image and the genomic information. To do this, we developed recently an algorithm called STNet which is an algorithm that actually translates from histology images into spatially resolved genomic profiles, right? So how it works is that it's sort of solving like an image to image translation problem, right? So it takes this input, this kind of standard histology image, and then it translates this, this histology image into hundreds of new images, right? So each new image corresponds to the gene expression profile of a different gene, right? And these are spatial profiles. So let's say if you're interested in this, breast cancer marker, it's called FASN, it's one of the key genes, right? Based on this histology image, our algorithm STNet would generate a new image that will tell you where is this gene, where is this breast tumor marker highly expressed, that's the yellow regions, and where is it lowly expressed, that's the blue regions. If you're interested in a different gene, right? This is a collagen marker, right? So we generate a different image that tell you where this is, is this collagen marker highly expressed or lowly expressed. And these computationally generated expression profiles, we're able to validate them experimentally. So they actually are in very good agreement with experimental measurements, right? And we can do this now to computationally generate hundreds of, uh, for based on this histology image, the expression profiles of over hundred genes. I think that's actually quite interesting, quite useful in practice. So, uh, and this also works well on different patients, right? If you have a new patient, here's a new biopsy. The algorithm also quite, works quite well. It generates the expression profile for the gene FASM, which agrees well with the experiment. Right, so this work is also published recently in Nature Biomedical Engineering, and it's worked a lot by Brian. So I want to tell you about a little bit about how this technology works, right? So first I'll tell you about how do we even experimentally measure these spatial expression profiles um, and how do we train this algorithm to, you know, to computationally generate these kind of measurements? So to generate the training data for the algorithm, right? So we leverage this spatial transcriptomic technology that's developed by my collaborator, Joachim Lindbergh, who's really a pioneer in this area. 
So Yocom developed this very nice chip. Right? So it's a tiny little chip. And what you do is that when you have this biopsy, let's say from the breast cancer patient, you just overlay the biopsy on top of the chip. Right? So this is a tissue you put it on top of the chip. So each dot of the chip actually corresponds to a set of probes, which has its own barcode that tells you where the XY location of where that probe is. Right? So think of the probe as having like a zip code. So when the tissue is overlaid on top of the probe, the probes actually penetrate into the cells, sort of like little needles. And when each probe actually identifies in one of the genes, it attaches this zip code, the barcode on top of the gene. Right? So that's how we know where each gene is when, it's, when we sequence them. That's how we get the spatial information of the XY locations. Okay, so the algorithm then uh, is trained on this data set that we've collected from breast cancer patients. Right, so the algorithm itself is a particular kind of convolutional neural network model. So here the key thing is that the image itself is actually has to be quite high resolution, right? So unlike standard kinds of computer vision algorithms, which are working on you know, a thousand or a few hundreds by a few hundred pixels, here each image typically has over 10,000 pixels by 10,000 pixels, just because they're very large high resolution images. Right. So this enables us to look at in fine grained detail of what are the morphologies and the architectures of different cells. And what the algorithm is doing is basically scanning across this image. It learns a representation right, that captures different morphology, different features of individual uh, cellular neighborhoods. And based on that, it translates in this into expression profiles for over 100 genes that we're interested in. Right. And we here, as before, we also tested the algorithm on external patient samples. Right here, one of the companies actually in the Bay Area called 10X Genomics had done in parallel, you know, independently had done their own experiments to on um, breast cancer patients, right, to extract profiles, expression profiles that are spatially resolved. Uh, and they have their own images. Right? So we just froze the algorithm within too many hyperparameters and we just applied it to this external test data. Each dot here corresponds to one gene, right? At the X, Y axis corresponds to how well did our algorithm work, right? On that gene in generating that spatial transcriptome profile. Right? So the X, Y axis are basically accuracies on two different test samples from this external 10X genomics company. So we're especially interested in these genes at the top here, right? So these are genes where you know, based on, on our internal data and also on external validation data, we can make very accurate predictions. So there are over 100 genes here, right? And they include many of the tumor markers, markers for immune systems, as well as markers that tell you how genes are moving around their architectures. Right? So this is where, uh, these are genes where we can generate accurate profiles. And the algorithm is also very nice because it also tells you, you can interpret it and it tells you actually when within each of these tissues, right? Where exactly are the genes highly expressed? So for example, here it learns that there are these larger enlarged nuclei of cells right, that corresponds to settings where this tumor marker fastum tends to be overexpressed. And you can do this systematically to see which, you know, what are the geometry, geometric features of individual cells, right? And how does that actually individual nuclei and how does that relate to the expression profiles of each of the hundreds of genes that we can measure? Right, so this actually is a very powerful tool because it gives you a way to associate the expression, the molecular information about each gene with the morphology, the geometry of the cells and the, of the nuclei. All right, so this works quite well now that we've trained and developed the algorithm. The algorithm works quite well on images that people have collected from archives, from clinical labs. Right? And our ultimate goal is to really think of this as sort of a you know, Instagram for pathology, right? So in standard Instagram, you have a photo, you can overlay all sorts of features of dogs and cats. Right, but here we can actually take photos right, of these biopsy samples and in real time generate computationally generate these filters that correspond to the, the genomic, the molecular profiles right, of different genes of interest. Right, to do this experimentally would take you know, potentially many months. That would be quite expensive. But we can computationally generate these filters now for free almost instantaneously because the algorithm is developed. Right. And this kind of image can potentially help with clinicians, physicians in coming up with different prognosis and design treatments right, for patients as uh, based on the tumor heterogeneity. Right? And also, as we've seen, can teach us interesting new biology about how genes, molecular information can connect it with the geometry of the cells. 
Okay. So in the last couple of minutes, I want to tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing in really trying to understand and to interpret what these computer vision networks are doing, right? Because these interpretations are quite important, especially for medical applications, but also for scientific discovery. So these computer vision networks are typically these quite large convolutional networks, right? Have many thousands or tens of thousands of artificial neurons. So here's just an example of this for concreteness, right? Let's say if you're want, wanting, you want to build a classifier to predict given an image, right? Whether this image corresponds to an active volcano, right? So you might use one of these standard networks called Inception V3. So Inception V3 actually has over 20,000 artificial neurons. Maybe and you've trained this model, but it's actually quite difficult to interpret because it's quite a large model. But what we discovered recently is that even though this trained network of Inception V3, it might have 20,000 neurons, but there are only a very small number of the artificial neurons, only around 15 or 20 of these neurons that are actually really important. And we have developed an efficient algorithm that we call neuron Shapley value that enables us to quickly identify where are these important critical neurons. And we know that there are only 15 neurons that are really important because we can do the following test. Right, we can just say, what happens to the network if I just remove each of these 15 neurons? The x-axis corresponds to how many neurons that we removed. Right? So if we remove these neurons that have the highest neuron Shapley value, so in other words, the neurons that we think are really important, after removing 15 of them, right, you can see the network's performance, that's the recall on the y-axis, has completely disappeared. Whereas in contrast, if I just simply remove random artificial neurons from this big network, the performance of the network doesn't really change, right? Because it's just you know, 15, 30 neurons randomly chosen out of 20,000, right? So it's just a drop in the bucket. So I, this is actually really surprising to us that after you train the model, there's such a small number of critical neurons that are really important for the decision-making of this neural network. It's also extremely good news for practitioners, right? Because now if you want to understand what this neural network's doing, you don't have to look at all 20,000 neurons. That's really complicated. You just have to look at what these 15 important neurons are doing. And that's something that we can actually do you know, quite quickly. So we can just do this ourselves as an experiment, right? So here I'm showing you, right, for this volcano predictor, the single most important neuron, the one that has, by our calculation, the highest neuron Shapley value, is actually sitting in this middle layer, the sixth layer of the network. And to visualize this neuron, I'm just showing you three of the images that give you the highest activation for that artificial neuron, right? Three images that induce the highest value for that neuron. And you can take a look and see you know, how you might interpret these images, right? Um, you know, it's actually pretty clear that this particular neuron here is essentially looking for like white puffs, right? So the white puff could be mashed potato, it could be fountains, so it could be smokes. Right, so it doesn't really care which one it is, but it's looking for white puffs. So now that we've learned that the single most important neuron for this volcano detector is actually looking for white puffs. The second most important neuron for this volcano detector is on the next layer, right? And here are the three images that give the highest activation value for the second most important neuron. And it turns out here that this neuron is actually basically looking for green mountains, right? sort of green triangular shapes. And now I think I claim that we actually have a pretty good understanding of what this whole network is doing, right? So it's two most important neurons in this network is one of them is looking for white puffs. The next one's looking for these green mountains. If the network finds both of those, then it knows pretty well that it's gonna be an active volcano. If it's missing either one of those, right? Then the network will not work very well, right? So it seems like these puff clock detector and the green mountain detector are unique in the network. And this is really the insight uh, that I think that's really quite interesting and quite useful, right? Is that in many of these cases, right? Um, after we've trained these deep nets, um, after training, right? They oftentimes have a small number of critical neurons, right? 10, 20, right? A small number of critical neurons. And we have proposed a very efficient algorithm based on this neuron Shapley value to quickly identify where these important neurons are. And just by interpreting and visualizing what this, a few important neurons are doing, right, then you have actually a good understanding holistically of this, what this entire model that neural network is doing. So this is actually described in detail in this upcoming NeurIPS paper, which we'll present at NeurIPS uh, next week. 
so just to wrap up, um, so here are the resources, right? Uh, and so all of the papers and codes and data sets that describe these projects are available on my website. And here are the references for each of these three works. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what are some of the recent advances in computer vision and how we can interpret these computer vision algorithms. And then how can we apply them to address important problems in human disease, like you know, heart disease and cancer. And so I want to acknowledge again the fantastic students and postdocs in the group that led this work. So David, Brian, and Amirata. So I'm happy to stop here and happy to take any questions that people have. Awesome presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, the first one, yes, uh, I will, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to the audience have some time to generate questions. And the, but I have one from the audience. Uh, he's saying, or she's saying, uh, hi, Professor Zhou. Uh, I wanted to ask how hard was it, was it to obtain and label training data for Econite? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, the, it, it does take quite a bit of work and resources to obtain this data set, right? So this is actually the full data set that we generated to train Econet. Um, so part of the work is actually in extracting the data and making sure it's clean, right? There's actually quite a lot of work in making sure that the data is fully anonymized that enables us to release and make publicly available all of these videos and the corresponding uh, the medical information of the patients. But now that we've done all the hard work, we actually have released all of this data for free, right? So now all of you can, can access and you know, use this data yeah. um, then to develop new models and algorithms. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, the next one is, what is a frame per second or per minute uh, when you are recording the example one? and uh, Will adding more frames will or remove frames will be affect the pro, uh, affect the performance of the model? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So so here are some you know, examples of actually the real echocardiograms, these ultrasound videos of the heart, right? So um, we did do various experiments to see how much uh, resolution in terms of temporal resolution would help the model. Actually, it turns out that you don't need to have too much temporal resolution, right? So we actually, for the optimal algorithm here, we actually end up having to down sample a little bit. So to because the actual frame rate that's captured in this ultrasound ends up being too high. So we actually have to down sample a little bit. So the model becomes more efficient, right? So I would say that um, uh, there's a lot of information, right? So you know, here you can see that Every second, you can get a lot of information from the individual beat of the heart, right? So we don't need to have actually very high frame rates in order for the algorithms to work. Awesome. Uh, so uh, in the ex example one, you're showing us that there are two branches in the architecture. Yes. So what is the architecture for the segment segmentation branch? I know the uh, for the uh, the, the top branch is inception night, right? What is the second one? Can you uh, explain a little bit? Of oh, yes, yes. So, so the, yeah, so from the given input video, right, the second branch here is basically doing a uh, segmentation, right, of this chamber of the heart. It's called the left ventricle chamber. Um, a segmentation itself uses, is, we'll have some more detail in the paper, but it basically uses a particular kind of sort of atrius convolution, right? So that basically just means that we can start from a larger field of view and then look, look at increasingly higher resolutions. And the key part of the segmentation is that the, we actually do not have a lot of supervision, right, for the segmentation. Because if you recall that the current workflow is that the clinician is the only label and only do the segmentations for when the frame is the largest, right? When this chamber is largest and when the chamber is the smallest. Whereas for the algorithm, it actually needs to learn to do the segmentations for all of the intermediate frames as well, but we don't have any training data for that. So that ends up being sort of the most interesting challenge is how do we actually, do, with relatively weak supervision, able to do the segmentations across all of the frames. So we have like a continuous segmentation. Uh, so the details of that are of, of how we did that are described in the paper. 
Awesome. Uh, so another question is from myself. Uh, I wonder, uh, have you tried other besides resonance architecture? And uh, what is the rationale why you choose uh, to use resonance for this uh, particular Econet model? Right. Right. So, so we did try several architectures, um, and we have a systematic comparison of the performance of different architectures on this algorithm. And the one that we ended up using here is sort of the one that had the best results and the most consistent results across different across different settings. So, I would say that you know, the the thing that we really want to optimize for is are some of these metrics that I mentioned, right? So make sure that the algorithm really works well, not just in our own test data, but on external test data. And also, it works reliably well. It's very robust to noise, right? So these are some of the considerations that we that have been behind our designs of the architectures and our choice of the modeling. Uh, the next question is: uh, in the frame, in the uh, frame, it's, it's still the example one. In the frame, uh, there are a lot of black, which is to be labeled as zero. So, is there? Did you happen to find a way to learn the sparse image? Or uh, did you figure out a way to remove some of the useless pixels to speed up the training? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the segmentation does help us in that sense, right? Because the segmentation tell you tells that the neural network. So I feel this is really the most important part of the of the video, right? So there's there could be a lot of things that are going on in other parts, in other backgrounds, but this is really the most important part to focus on, right? And by having these two arms that work together, right? So that I think does work as a way to somehow regularize the model. So it uses segmentation information to say here are the, the relevant beats of the heart, and then it actually uses that to estimate the ejection fraction, which is sort of the power generation of the heart for every individual beat. Uh, that's that's a great. That's thank you so much. Uh, so the question on the second example that would be uh, when applying the spatial transcriptomic, you all have to collect a lot of the cells for multiple reasons. Will there a problem have a data bias confounding uh, when training? For example, uh, a lot uh, a lot of the selected site might. Uh, the majority will be normal tissues. Uh, only a yeah. hundred will be the tumor tissue. How did you solve that problem? Yeah, that's also a very good question. So thank you for that. So this is actually a good example of this, right? So this is so at the bottom here is basically you have the clinician's annotation, the pathologist's annotation of for this biopsy, right, which part is tumor or normal. So for this particular patient biopsy, right, so the clinician actually says that, oh, almost this entire biopsy corresponds to tumor. Right? So it's all marked black. So that might seem quite homogeneous, but when we actually do the spatial measurement, right, the experimental measurement or the computational prediction for this key breast cancer tumor marker, FASN, right, there's actually quite a lot of heterogeneity, quite a lot of variation, even though this entire biopsy is labeled as tumor, right? So that means that even within just tumor regions or even within entire normal regions, there's already a lot of heterogeneity in how genes are expressed, you know, based on their interactions with their neighbors, based on their context. So there's actually a lot of data uh, within each image, right? Uh, so the potential you know, biases in the algorithm, that's certainly one very important thing, right? Which is also why here we're very careful to validate the algorithm not just on our internal patients, but also on external patients, right? So these are external patients that are collected, as I mentioned, by a company called 10X Genomics. So they had their own imaging platform, so it, which is different from ours. They also had their own sequencing setup, which is also a little bit different from ours, right? So this is actually quite a different patient sample and quite different data set. Then that's why we ultimately want to test how well would our algorithm, without any modification or hyperparameter tuning, work out of the box on this very different set of patients. Right? And that's why we're very happy to see that you know, these genes that we're interested in, over 100 genes, it actually works very well on the external patients, just as well on external patients as, as they did on our internal test patients. Awesome. Thank you so much for the answer. So the next question uh, is actually like uh, uh, three questions. So I will uh, help you uh, 
go over. So the first one uh, is how do you overcome the huge label bias medical data always have? The number of health people is way higher than the one having some problems. And the second is how did you make the architecture search for the model? And the last one is uh, how did you ensure there was no data, data leakage for the test data? test set okay great yeah, these are all quite good questions so um for the first question i so saw it is true that for many diseases right there's a huge bias right there's a lot more healthy patients than there are disease patients fortunately or maybe unfortunately for 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 the community right so heart disease and cancer are quite common in our population right so for example for heart disease we see that uh, you know, one in four death in all of the U.S. Right, over six hundred, over half a million deaths every year corresponds to heart disease. So there are actually a lot of patients. That means that you know, at Stanford or many of other hospitals, many of the patients that come in, they actually have heart disease. Right, so then that gets that's how we are able to have such a large, relatively balanced data set. Cancer is also you know very prevalent. So something like breast cancer is quite prevalent. And here we also benefit from the fact that even um, that there's a lot of heterogeneity, right? Even within each cancer patient, right? So again, this is a good example where you, even you have this one patient who is mostly tumor, right? Where you can have a patient that's mostly normal, but even within different tissues of the same patient, you actually have some are labeled, you know, some have true label tumor, and some have true label normal, right? So there's a lot of heterogeneity there. Uh, so that's something we leverage in training and developing these machine learning models. And then to, you know, to your other question about how do we safeguard against leakage, I think the best way is to really have data that are collected from very different sources, right? So in this case, it's data that's collected afterward from by a different you know, company, so we have no interaction with them, right? So that's a good way to test it. For the cardiology one, right, so the data that we used to, for testing also also come from a different hospital, right? So clearly using a different platform with different clinicians. So, so we had no access to that. So using these different external test data, I think this is really the best way to safeguard against data leakage. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, another question about the STNet is uh, here you're using like 20, uh, uh, two, sorry, 250 genes. Will include more genes uh, will help because human have over twenty three uh, thousand genes and uh, also for the gene expression uh, the value you collected from the gene uh, the assays will be over thir uh, over sixty k values so will include the more biomarker or genes will be help uh, for the purpose yeah. So that's a great question, and I think that's not something we're actively working on now. So we think that that's a proof of concept, right? This is a sort of the first demonstration that this is possible. As a proof of concept, we're quite happy to capture these over 100 genes, and these are genes that uh, actually are some of the higher have higher expression values, right? So the more abundantly expressed genes, and I think um, the one of the limitation we had in this original data set is just the depth of sequencing, right? As we sequence deeper, we can capture more and more genes to train the algorithm. So I think I'm quite confident that with some of the larger data sets, we will be able to push this to several hundred genes. Um, because there are many genes that we believe we can actually learn effectively from the morphology of the tissue. Awesome, thank you. And the last question will be on example three, uh, the expa explainable machine learning. Yeah. So uh, removing 15 neurons out of 20K will be uh, decrease the performance, but how to search this, how to efficiently search these 15, uh, 15 neurons just for one layer uh, out of the 20 case. Of, uh, also, uh, for the explainable, for the classes, there are a thousand classes for the image light, just for the image light, and how to generalize the whole interpre interpreting process. Okay, great. So those are those are very good questions. So to find these fifteen, right, the small number of important neurons. 
that's actually what we wrote this paper on. Uh, so I, I won't have time to go through this in too much detail, but the high level, what we do is that we actually have uh, an adaptive algorithm based on multi-arm bandits right, for computing what we're calling these neuron Shapley values. So the neuron Shapley value basically assigns a score for every neuron in the network. Right? The higher the score is, that means the more important that neuron is. So we have an efficient way to, based on this multi-arm bandit, to compute this neuron Shapley value. And then what we do here is simply just take the 15 neurons that have the highest Shapley score. Uh, so these are end up being the most important neurons, right? So if I remove these 15 neurons with the highest Shapley score, that's how we know the network's performance disappears. Um, and in contrast, if I just remove random neurons, right? Neurons, most of those neurons have close to zero Shapley values, right? So removing those neurons will not actually change the network's performance very much. So this incidentally also suggest some interesting ways you can sort of prune neural networks after training, right, to have a smaller network without damaging the performance. So the second question is related to, okay, so if you have actually many different classes, right, so what we actually do here is that this, this framework uh, that we described in the upcoming Europe's paper for computing neuron Shapley value is actually very flexible. You could actually generate an uh, important score, a Shapley score, for each class, it right, says that how important is this neuron for predicting volcanoes? How important is this neuron for predicting cats? How important is this neuron for predicting cancer? Right, so you can actually have a score, a different important score for each neuron, and that can be computed efficiently. Awesome. I think that's all the questions. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, presenting, and we learn a lot from your talk. And uh, hope everyone get a you know a sense what you are marvelous uh, research about. Uh, again, uh, I'm very happy to invite it, um, very kind of quite famous uh, professor Zhou. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, everybody have uh, have a good learning and have a good night. So for now, I just you know tell uh, say goodbye to everyone and uh, hope you guys join us next time. Great, thanks for the great questions. It's nice to meet all of you.